Hey, it's Marie Forleo, and you are watching Marie TV, the place to be to create a business and life you love. Now, if you want to give yourself the best possible chance of having a long, happy, and healthy life, my guest today is here to show us how. Dan Buettner is an explorer, National Geographic fellow, and award-winning journalist who's discovered the five places in the world, dubbed Blue Zones, where people live the longest, healthiest lives. He's a New York Times bestselling author of four books on the topic, The Blue Zones, Thrive, The Blue Zones Solution, and The Blue Zones of Happiness. His Blue Zones projects have dramatically improved the health of more than 5 million Americans to date. Dan has been seen on The Today Show, Oprah, NBC Nightly News, and Good Morning America. He also holds three Guinness World Records in distant cycling. Dan, thank you so much for making the time to be here. So uh, I'm a huge fan of your work. I was telling you off camera that I, I saw a talk that you did and I went down the Dan Buettner Blue Zones rabbit hole. I bought all of <laughs> your books. Very dark. It, it was actually, it was really, really fun. And uh, after like working all day and being on the computer, it was, it was a source of such joy for me. I was like, oh, I'm getting to go into the Blue Zones again. So let's take it back. Tell us how you ended up for the past 15 years studying longevity and happiness. How'd you get here? I've been a lifelong explorer, started out setting three world records for biking across five continents and eventually got with National Geographic, where I led uh, scientific expeditions to solve ancient mysteries. Why the Maya civilization collapsed, did Marco Polo go to China? And in the year 2000, I stumbled upon a very interesting report from the World Health Organization that found that Okinawans have the longest disability-free life expectancy in the world. In other words, they live a really long time and they avoid the diseases that are killing us. Yeah. And I said, aha, that's a good mystery. And, uh, and so it's been since 2001 or so, I've been, been trying to, you know, in a sense, reverse engineer longevity and then later happiness. Yeah. So happiness, it is somewhat a nebulous term, right? It's really difficult to define. And from what I've learned from you, you know, it's a composite of things. So as you've shared that, while yes, we cannot really measure happiness, we can measure the facets of it. There are three big ones. Can you tell us about those? Yes. So the first one and the and the the most um, uh, the, the most commonly used question uh, is around something called life satisfaction. So a researcher will ask you if you think of your life as a whole. Uh, with your best imaginable life being a 10 and your worst imaginable life being a, z a one, where would you place your happiness? Mm -hmm. And when that's done at the population level, you can get a really good reading on how well people and places evaluate their lives. Then there's a second kind of measuring happy uh, measure of happiness where you get at how people experience their lives. And because you only remember about 2% of your life, you tend to remember your, your high points you, when you got married or had your first child and your low points when you got dumped by a, a girlfriend or boyfriend or when your grandma died. Um, and what happened in the last 24 hours, asking people to remember their lives isn't a perfect way to measure well-being. But if you ask people in the last 24 hours, how much have you smiled? How much have you felt joy? How much have you felt stress? And you do that a few times, you can get a pretty good snapshot at how people experience their life. That's called positive affect. And then there's a third kind of happiness measurement that asks people how often they're able to use their strength to do what they do best. That's in the academic parlance, how you measure purpose. So when you ask those questions among populations around the world in a uniform way, you can start to see, number one, where people are happiest in these three measurements, and number two, the things that associate with happiness or correlate to happiness. And so tell us about some of the happiest places. So Blue Zones of Happiness and the cover story I wrote for National Geographic sought to illustrate each of these three types of happiness. So uh, we chose Singapore as the place the best demonstrate um, uh, life satisfaction. So uh, uh, Singapore is a place where it's very easy to live out your values. It's very secure. It's a place that will appeal to the type of people who like success laid out in a very simple path go to the right school, get the right job, keep your head down, work hard. And at the end, you'll have status, you'll be financially secure. And that's a type of happiness. Yeah. It's mostly happiness in the rearview mirror. I think I'm happy, therefore I, I must be. In Costa Rica, specifically Cartago in the Central Valley, that's a place where people are experiencing their life very well from day to day. It's a um, 
It's a high valley where the temperature only varies 10 degrees a year between about 65 degrees and 75 degrees. Best coffee in the world. Mm. Uh, but more importantly, it's a place where the cities are designed so you're bumping into people with some frequency all the time. You go to the market, you run into the people selling you their your fruits or your vegetables or or your fish. Um, you um, uh, the, the towns are built, for, the streets are built for human beings and not just cars. One of the biggest predictors of whether you'll be happy on a day-to-day -day basis is how many hours of face-to-face a time you have with people you like. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the happiest people in the world are interacting face-to-face -face about seven hours a day. And Cartago has an environment where it's easy to do that. And then we chose Northern uh, Denmark, a place called Alborg, to, to exemplify purpose because uh, Denmark's a place where uh, healthcare is taken care of. Everybody, nobody has to worry about what happens if I get sick. Education's taken care of. Nobody has to worry about, can I save enough money to put my kids through college? Because kids now go to college, so they get paid to go to university. And will I be okay when I'm old? So that those are big drivers of whether or not you take a job. It's also a place where status is not really celebrated. Mm. So you get no extra credit for wearing Prada or right. driving a Mercedes. Um, in fact, it's kind of frowned upon. So people aren't taking jobs for status or health insurance. They're taking jobs because they love it. In America, only about 30% of workers actually like their job. This comes from Gallup data. In Denmark, it's about 80%. They're working 35 hours a week. They're doing jobs suggestive of flow, uh, furniture design, architecture, niche technology. That's what they excel in in Denmark. So these are jobs that really uh, engage people's passions and their artistic abilities. Uh, it's not so hard that they give up and not so easy they get bored. They work 35 hours a week, take, take six weeks of vacation, have plenty of time for the social interaction we know is really fundamental when it comes to happiness. And was it interesting for you, like being energetically in these different places? Could you feel just for yourself, like, whoa, when you're in Costa Rica, that sense? I mean, I've been to Costa Rica, Costa Rica several times. And what's the saying of the country? It is uh, viva. Pura vida. Pura, yeah, exactly. Yeah, pure life. Yes. Yes. I would say more so in um, in Costa Rica, but but than than the other places because um, you really have to live there. It's not quite as easy to go there. I mean, you get of course you get the vacation effect. You know, sure. I don't have to work today for crying out loud. Yes. But you know, the sun's shining and the beach is near and all those things. So that's a different experience than actually living there. And and, and the reality we find that most. Um, when it comes to happiness, most people are misguided or just plain wrong. In, in fact, we uh, more often than not aim at the wrong target when it comes to lasting authentic happiness. And if you really want to understand those places, it can't just be a facile, well, I went there, I felt happy and people danced and we went to parties. That's that's not it. Yeah. Let's talk more about that though, how people are aiming at the wrong things. Because I've read that you suggest we think about happiness more like a retirement portfolio and that it should be balanced. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, people to ask me what's the secret of happiness, and that's like going to your doctor and say, "Doctor, I'm sick. Make me well." Right. You know, you have to you have to do some diagnostics. So, for example, so we talked about life satisfaction, how you experience life, and purpose. You want those three to be balanced. Yeah. Uh, you could work seventy hours a week and make a quarter million dollars a year, and and feel financially secure, and your friends are all impressed with you. But your day-to-day -day experience is crappy. Yeah. That's not happiness, yeah. even though you've kind of checked all the boxes in life. So um, we, we actually have a on our website, bluezones.com, we have a true happiness test, which is a diagnostic we did with the University of Pennsylvania that will ask you about 40 questions to be able to diagnose you. Are you experiencing mostly life satisfaction or or experience happiness or lack of purpose. And, and we we assess where you are in those three, and then we we give you a prescriptive. It's free, by the way. I love it. it. We'll make sure that we include that in the blog, and we'll include that in the email as well. So um, according to science, we humans have control of about 50% of our happiness, right? And the other 50% is about um, genetics and luck. Yeah. So lasting happiness, from your perspective, is something that everyone can create. So how do we start to take charge of that 50%? 
I think to, to realize that, so 50% is, is um, genetically pre prescribed for each of us. So we all have what I call um, a set range. So imagine scale one to 10, and you're a really happy person. And on a good day, you're a 10. And on a crappy day, you're a six. But somebody down the street who was born with a, a, a bad set of genes, on a good day, there are six. And on a crappy day, there are two. Mm. So you have control of where you are within your set range. You might be able to get out of it a little bit. But really, you're sort of, uh, for lack of a better, hormonally um, uh, endowed with a certain uh, um, capacity for happiness. So. I argue in Blue Zones of Happiness that um, if you want to maximize your set range, you want to shape your environment so you're more likely to be happy. And now there, there's big data around happiness. Gallup, the World um, uh, World Poll, World Database of Happiness for the, the book in the National Geographic article, we sucked in. 100 million data points and, and did the regression analysis to find out exactly what you can do to stack the deck in favor of happiness. Tell us, Dan. Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a number of things you can do. Um, so if happiness were a cake recipe, uh, it's important to, uh, you need food and shelter and, and, um, and, and education. That's, by the way, why Bhutan is not a very happy place. Bhutan is number 91 in the world. Everybody thinks Bhutan's a happy place. It's they not a, a happy place. They did a good marketing campaign, right? They did a good marketing <laughs> campaign. And they do deserve credit for coming up with the idea of gross national happiness. Mm -hmm. So if you can't measure, you can't manage it. So they get big kudos. They just don't have an economy or a distribution uh, a scheme so that enough people have the basics in life. So you need the basics. Um, you need education. You don't need to have a doctorate degree, but it's really important to have at least a high school and some college to maximize your happiness. Uh, you need satisfying work. You're more likely to be happy if you if you are in a committed relationship than not. Uh, having kids, by the way, is a mixed bag. Um, you you want to have a feeling of giving back. But the most important ingredient, the ingredient with the most variance, is where you live. Mm -hmm. And we know that because watching immigrants move from Moldavia, an unhappy place in the Soviet bloc country, to Copenhagen, and when we watch people from unhappy places in Africa and Asia move to Canada, which is a happy place, those immigrants, they don't change their sex, their gender, they don't change their education status much, they don't, inc they don't change their, set, their genetic endowment, they don't change their sexual preference, they're the same people. And all they do is move, and within one year, they report the happiness level of their adopted home. So in Moldavia, for example, the average score is three. They move to an eight. Wow. And in Canada, they move from a four or five to an eight. So And all they do is move. So your environment, uh, where you live or how you shape your surroundings, is the biggest, most important, and most impactful thing you can do to uh, favor your own happiness. Let's talk about that for a second, because we have viewers, <clears throat> excuse me, in 195 countries around the world, and there will be a certain portion of people listening to this who hopefully will dive into all of your work, this is what I want them to do, and they may discover, you know what, I am going to pick up and move. I'm not a tree. So they might be able to, and we'll talk about more uh, about what makes for a great environment in terms of where you live. But I know there are many, many other thousands of people watching go, okay, well, if I can't pick up and move or necessarily change where I live, at least right now. Let's talk about some of those shapers of our immediate environment and what we can do to stack the deck in our favor. Yes. Yeah, so the first and foremost is curate a group of friends around you. We, we, know, we now know that unhappiness and loneliness are contagious. So if you sit around with people who are unhappy and are, are lonely, I'm not telling you to abandon your old friends because they need a hand, but if you're continuously doing that's going to be contagious. You can actually measure that. A guy named Nicholas Christakis has found that. Um, you want uh, three to five friends who, number one, you have a, you can have meaningful conversations with them. And I mean, conversations of the heart, not just sports or celebrity. Uh, these should be friends you can call on a bad day and they'll care. That's kind of the litmus test. If my chips are down, are they still going to be with me? And number three, you actually have to like them. And you want to sense been face to face. There's no really good research showing that that um, connecting on Facebook or Snapchat or something is the same as what we're doing right now. Yeah, connecting face to face. Um, number two, 
uh, when it comes to your financial life, the impact of financial security is about three times more powerful than consumption. What does that mean? That means if you just got a raise or there's some money left over in your paycheck, over time, you're actually better off paying down your mortgage, buying insurance, joining one of these automatic savings plans than you are going out and buying a new pair of shoes or new gadget because the luster of that new thing will wear off in nine to 14 months, but financial security can last years, decades, or lifetime. So that's that's more important. Uh, I would say when it comes to uh, your work life, this comes from more than 2 million surveys from, from Gallup. Um, the biggest determinant of whether or not you're like your job is not how much money you make, not how much recognition you get, not what your boss tells you about yourself. It's do you have a best friend at work? I loved this insight. Tell us more. Yeah. So if if you're if you don't like your job or it's suboptimal, um, the, the making the effort to invite a coworker out um, to organize the happy hour. Uh, I actually uh, I run these blue zone projects around the world, uh, or well around the country actually, about forty cities, and we have over a hundred. Uh, workplace, sorry, workplaces that um, that uh, work with us. And one of the things we do, we actually create MOIs. We require, a MOI is a committed social network and we get all the employees to come together and we have a process by which we help them break into groups of five. And then we organize them around either walking, a healthy activity or eating Blue Zones food, which is to say plant-based uh, whole foods. And um, we find that about 60 to 70% of the time, these people, these kids, or these uh, workers stay together and um, become best friends. That's amazing. I was talking about this to someone the other day, and um, I was telling you off camera that we have a virtual company. And so we don't see each other face to face every day, but um, Team Forleo, which we call ourselves, Everyone really actually- Where did you get that name? <laughs> I don't know. It was such a creative brainstorm. But everyone really likes each other. And one of the things that's been really satisfying for me as a boss is oftentimes when uh, my team has break time or we go on vacation or um, you know there's downtime, they get together in person on their own. I and it, it makes me so happy because they want everybody winds up sending pictures and like, oh, I visited my friend here, but then I'm going to go see so-and-so. And it's such a great feeling to know how connected everyone is. And then when we talk with folks who don't have a culture like we have, and I see so much pain because they don't feel connected to anyone at work, yeah. it becomes really apparent because we're spending what, 8, 10, 12 hours a day? Five days a week, if not more. Most of your waking life. Yeah. Do you do you actually vacation together? So last year, we um, I took the entire company. <laughs> They're off camera, raising hands. Yeah. <laughs> um, we actually all went on vacation together to Mexico, and there was absolutely no um, business meeting at all. We danced, we drank margaritas, mm. we went. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> we went in the in the ocean at midnight because we were like dancing and sweating, and we're like, we need to cool off. Um, but it was one of the best things that we've ever done oh, as a company. And especially- That's so smart. Yeah, it was really great. And we have memories that'll last a lifetime. And then it also kind of sends the message, by the way, that that um, your employees aren't just um, here to further the interests of the company, that you actually care about. Oh, yeah. The, and, they know that. And that's transparent. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. They. I mean, you I got, how that. do you feel? Do you, you know Mama loves you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mama, I like that. Mama Marie. Well, I don't have biological kids. I have a stepson, but I call affectionately known as Mama Marie. So let me one of the other things I love about your perspective, because it's so fresh, that you're not a huge advocate of positive psychology techniques like savoring or appreciation or gratitude. Not that they don't work, but only in the short run. So tell me about um why not that and why, again, I agree with you, optimizing our environment is the way to go. Yeah, I, I could not find any research that shows that the positive psychology interventions have any long term. It, you know, it's a lot like a vegan diet. So there is um, indisputable evidence that eating a, a vegan whole food diet will help you lose weight and live longer. But people can't stay on that diet. Diets last on average, um, so, well, they work for 10% of people for three months. Within seven months, you lose 90%. And within two years, you lose about 97%. I believe it's the same with these positive psychology interventions, savoring, appreciation journals, gratitude. They're all great ideas. And they all 
work. I don't dispute the studies, but the studies are all done in three months or something like that. So when it comes to happiness, it's got to be a long-term pursuit. And uh, I, I don't know of any way to uh, establish gratitude for more than a a year. Well, I think most of us as humans, if we look at our own lives, and again, I have to say this because I know my audience and I know they're going to be like, ah, no, Dan, especially because Chris Carr and I are our best friends. She's going to be like, vegan is not a diet, it's a lifestyle. So yes, everyone, for those of you who have adopted um, and you eat vegan as a lifestyle, we love you. What Dan's talking about is research and it's slightly different. Again, I have this ability to hear people's um, what they're going to say <laughs> wait, 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 in wait, advance. What are, what, are they, what, are, what are they worried about? Um, remember when you said, well, the vegan diet, like people only do it for a short amount of time. I know people that they're yeah, that way. For, yeah. You know, that's their life. Like Chris Carr, for example. Right. So I'm, I just mean, yes, and, and you're right. Uh, vegans is more of a, a, a moral way of living, uh, ethical way of living. But I, I should say to just getting on any diet, Absolutely. trying to adopt a new diet. And there are hundreds of them that come on the on on the scene every year. And there's been no diet in the history of the world that works for more than two or 3% of the people for over two years. Mm. So um, trying to ask somebody to remember to do the right thing and to have the discipline to do the right thing by themselves will almost always fail. Yeah, and that's why I like this idea about really setting up your environment to nudge you. You know, yeah. we were talking again uh, before we had the cameras rolling. Um, I spend uh, some of my time here in New York City, and I also spend some of my time in Los Angeles, specifically in Venice, where I ride my bike a lot. And I notice how happy I am there because I'm riding my bike, I'm walking around. There's less congestion typically than there is here in New York City, and I think it's just so interesting that. Um, rather than like striving to be happy, I feel like what your perspective is out is kind of laying out for us is like the lazy way to do it in the sense where if you set up your environment, it almost starts to happen automatically. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And by the way, um, when you're in Venice, there is something called the sun bonus. So if you control for everything else, if you live in a sunny environment, you're about 5% more likely to be happy. That's and, what it is for me. <laughs> and, and also if you live by water. Yeah. Well, it's actually water or mountains. So the, those two, you're just more likely to be happy. And it may be because water is serene or maybe because you, you get to swim or it may be because um, you like sunsets. But but um, yeah, moving to a sunny beachy area is, stacks the deck in your favor. Yeah, one way to do it. So shifting over to longevity for a moment, um, I thought one of the most interesting things to come out of the research that you've done in Okinawa where we have the longest lived women was this concept of ikigai. Can you share a little bit more about what that term means? Yeah, and roughly it's an Okinawan term that means roughly the reason for which I wake up in the morning. And um, interestingly, Okinawan, Okin the Okinawan language does not have a word for retirement. So there's none of this sort of artificial punctuation between my productive and useful life and my life of repose or whatever. Um, and it, it, you know, it's legislatively mandated in this country, in many places, in many professions, you have to stop working. It doesn't happen in Okinawa. You'll, you'll see 104 year olds still in the market and 102 year olds who are still doing karate. They're, they're putting their ikigai, their sense of purpose to work. And that's so important. Uh, I also believe the notion of ikigai, uh, and I was just in Okinawa two weeks ago. I've been there several times for this research. Um, also metabolizes the notion of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, I like to knit, or it's not just, well, I like to golf. Uh, it's living out your meaning, but in a way that gives back. So in all these blue zones, longevity hotspots, older people, A, are celebrated, but B, um, have a feeling like it's their job to make sure the, the next two or three generations have a successful life. So they're helping raise the children, raise the garden, pass down culinary wisdom, uh, pass down resilience in many cases, pass down um, information on making sure crops work and how to deal with hardship and depression. Uh, something called the grandmother effect is shown that when there's a grandmother or grandfather living in the home or near the home, the children in that home have lower rates of disease and lower rates of mortality. So it's a beautiful kind of circle uh, that favors life expectancy, it favors happiness. None of it requires a pill. None of it requires you paying for a program. None of it requires 
that you conjure discipline. It's just a, a way of thinking about life that's very different than what's de rigueur here in the United States. So for all of the research that you've done and all of the experiences that you've had over the past 15 years, how have the insights that you've gleaned changed or not changed your own personal behavior? Like, have you noticed yourself making different life choices based on what you've discovered? Yes, I, I was a, an ultra marathon athlete. And now I, I, I don't believe in that at all. I believe that's a net negative trying to, you know, be older than about 40 and trying to run triathlons. I think it's a bad idea. Uh, so I've gone from uh, ultra distance cycling to doing yoga. Uh, I've gone uh, mostly plant-based. I'm 99% plant-based. I'm a big believer in that. I'm very clear at what my sense of purpose is. And I order my day so that I'm doing things to further the purpose rather than further my bank account or something. Or, you know, I, I don't chase after money or status or these things that I might have done when I was younger. Um, I put a lot more time, energy, and effort into my friends. Yeah. And uh, I, I have let some friends go because I realized they weren't good for me. And, and uh, I, I've added new, a, a new social network to, to my life in the last two or three years. Um, and they tend to be people who are plant-based. They tend to be people whose idea of recreation is playing tennis or uh, ocean swimming or scuba diving. So that that's what I do with them rather than sit around and watch football or eat hot dogs or something. And uh, the friends that care about me. And so I'm, I've done that. And how would you define your sense of purpose? I learned the importance of it and I thought about, I actually sat down and, and wrote it down. It just, it's not hard to do. Um, we actually give purpose workshops and purpose is really the, the cross section between what your values are, what you like to do, what you're good at and what you have to give. Mm. And one easy way to do is to simply take a piece of paper four columns, put one heading, one of those, each of those I just mentioned in the heading and write down, it just have to be two word. Uh, I'm good at, at um, the first idea. I'm good at communication. I'm good at education. I'm good at um, um, resolving conflict. And then you do the same thing with your values and what you like to do and what you can give back. And you look at that page, it becomes very clear. You'll see the same words show up on each of the four columns. And that's what your purpose is. And you should be asking yourself, is that what I do at my work? Mm -hmm. And if not, you might rethink your work. And then you should ask yourself, are the people I'm surrounding myself with, are they reinforcing what, what this, my purpose is? And asking yourself, <clears throat> in my leisure time, am I... In my, do I have an outlet for that? Given the whole spectrum of what we've covered, if we want to leave folks with one or two things that from your heart to theirs, you'd want them to either focus on or, or think about, what would you say? Well, the cross section for both longevity and happiness are your social network, who you hang out with. Uh, and also think about where you live. I know this sounds stupid and you think, well, I can't move. But we it's so clear Places like Boulder, Colorado, and San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Minneapolis, Minnesota, that people there are living measurably higher quality lives. No, And I say this because nobody else will say it, but I also mm -hmm. say it believing that it will have the biggest. If you live in an unhappy place, the most important thing you should do is move to a happier place. And we now know what those are. You can go to uh, the Gallup website. Uh, there's a, something called the Gallup Share Care Wellbeing Index. Uh, that measures happiness in 250 or so cities. And you can very clearly see which ones are producing happiness and moving there because again, it's long-term and it's nudges. It's not, it's not meeting that person that you dreamed of or getting the raise or the job, or if I could just save $500,000, I'd be happy. It never works like that. We, we almost always miss, uh, calculate the amount of happiness that we'll get from this has been proven than any thing we want we think we want in the future and we're wrong about half the time so saying to ourselves i want that and then ordering our whole life to get that's a bad strategy mm -hmm. much better strategy to look at what are statistically more likely to make me happy 
and set up your life to do so. And then I know you also mentioned too that you guys have an incredible um, meals blue planner. Can you mention yes. that as well? Yes. So the average American could live about 10 extra years uh, by optimizing their lifestyle. And I believe the runway is your diet. We we have a new meal planner at uh, meals.bluezone.com uh, that makes it really easy to eat like a centenarian. We went and found the not only the foods that the longest lived people eat, but also the recipes that make them taste good. The most important ingredient in any longevity diet is taste. I could tell you that fermented tofu will add eight years to your life, but if you taste fermented tofu and hate it, you ain't going to eat it. Right. So it's got to be food that's delicious, and this this uh, Blue Zone meal app does a really good job of it. Dan, thank you so much for your work and for your adventure and for everything that you're bringing to us. It's really it's made a big difference for me. I love I'm sharing it with my family, and I'm excited about all the Marie TV audience getting it too. So thank you. Well, I'm, I'm delighted. Just let me say, you absolutely exude happiness. And it was really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, Dan and I would love to hear from you. So we talked about so many things today, but I'm curious, what's the biggest insight that you're taking away? And most importantly, how can you turn that insight into action starting right now? Now, as always, the best conversations happen over at the magical land of marieforleo.com. So head on over there and leave a comment now. Once you're there, be sure to subscribe to our email list and become an MF Insider. You're going to get instant access to an audio I created called How to Get Anything You Want. Plus, you'll get exclusive content, special giveaways, and personal insights from me that I don't share anywhere else. Stay on your game and keep going for your dreams because the world needs that very special gift that only you have. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll catch you next time on Marie TV. Ready to find your voice and sell with heart? We'll show you how. Get started now with our free writing class at thecopycure.com. Side effects include enlarged profits. Yeah, I, I, I drink less tequila now. Do you? <laughs> so I still I, like tequila. I, I do too, yeah, so I have my... <laughs> yep, yep, yes. Yes. Yes, yes. everybody say yes. <laughs>